Welcome back friends. In today's session uh, we are going to discuss about the type C of organic reactants and as we said in the previous session which was session 2 of organic chemistry at the part of introduction we introduced the important concepts of organic chemistry about the properties of carbon which they are very important for them to understand later as we are going on with our topic of organic chemistry. So, we had a small quiz in the previous session, in the last session. I said we need to classify these compounds into whether they are aliphatic, heterocyclic, homocyclic, or aromatic. So, I know for some of you who understood the session, uh, this quiz was very easier for you to tackle. But I know for, for some of you, it was tough. So, I can just pass through this. Uh, quickly and then uh, we will continue with our session. So starting with our our first compound A, uh, this is aromatic. The reason why it is ar ar aromatic, aromatic. So the reason why it is aromatic, it is because it contains benzene ring. The compound itself it is benzene. If you are not present in the, in the previous session, if you have not viewed it. I say that uh, uh, a benzene ring uh, contains six carbons and in these six carbons there are double bond in alternate positions. So if there is a double bond in this position, there will be also double bond in this position, also double bond here. But in a simplified structure of benzene now, according to the mesomeric effect of electrons, we are drawing a structure of benzene as this way and then here we are drawing a circle. This is the structure of benzene and as you said in the previous session that any organic compound containing benzene ring it will be called as aromatic hydrocarbon or aromatic organic compound. Now jumping to B this B is the cyclic compound, but it has oxygen here. So, as we said, in terms of cyclic compound, we can classify them into two major groups, either homocyclic or heterocyclic. And we said in homocyclic, we are classifying them again into alicyclic and aliphatic. I mean alicyclic and aromatic. So this is the heterocyclic organic compound. Heterocyclic organic compound. C is the homocyclic because it is the cyclic but it contains only carbon. It doesn't have any other element. D is homocyclic. It is not benzene because it doesn't have the cycle here in between and E is aliphatic F is aromatic because it contains one benzene ring however it contains cyclohexene here but it is homocyclic so today we are going to continue uh, we are going to continue with the, with the type C of organic reactants we are going to continue with the organic reaction. So I hope if you understood the previous sessions, it will be very easier for you to understand me in this session because some of the concepts are regarding the, the electronic configuration, uh, hybridization and things like that will also be repeated in this session. So better understanding of the previous session will easier your understanding in this session also. So just stay with me and then we'll go together you really understand well what you are teaching today. So today uh, we are going to discuss about the type C of organic reactants. Organic organic reactants. 
organic reactants. So, when we are talking of organic reactants, it doesn't mean all of them they are organic. Some of them they are inorganic. So the general meaning of organic reactant is that they are molecules which can take part in organic reactions. So we have a variety of reactions which organic compound they can perform and we will study them later. We have um, additional reactions, substitutional reactions and different categories of, of reactions. So we will discuss them later. But in these reactions, we have different categories of molecules which can take part. Now, all of these molecules in a collection, we call them as the organic reactants. So we have different categories of the organic reactants. We have different categories, but we are categorizing them into three major types, which are nucleophiles, electrophiles and free radical. So just stay with me and then later you will understand uh, what is nucleophile, electrophile and free radical and in what type of reaction these are involved in. So organic reactant is any species capable of taking part in organic reaction. Any species capable of taking part in organic reaction. Now important thing to note about organic reactant is that for a species to be an organic reactant not necessary for a substance to be organic. So some of them they are inorganic but still they are organic reactants. Compounds like aluminium chloride, aluminium chloride, we are writing it as aluminium Cl3. Compound like HCl, sulfuric acid, nitric, water, all of these, they are inorganic, but they are taking part in organic reactions, and that's why they are called as organic reactants. So a compound being inorganic is not the matter. The matter is that it takes part in the organic reaction. For example, aluminum chloride is a catalyst. Aluminum chloride is a catalyst. HCl, sulfuric, nitric, they are also catalysts. So, because they are taking part in the organic reaction and they are acting either by accepting electrons or releasing electrons, they are generally termed as the organic reactants. So, compounds like aluminum chloride and sulfuric acid are inorganic but are necessary for the substance to be, but are also termed organic reactants because they participate in organic reaction. So the major reason to be considered here is that the compound or the molecule tend to participate in the organic reaction. Now usually a substance can undergo chemical reaction if either it has a deficiency of electron so that it accepts electron during chemical reaction or it has excess of electron and then it supplies electrons during chemical reaction. Because we know any chemical reaction involves bond breaking and bond making. Any bond breaking that means we are separating the electrons which were bonded and then we put them separate. And then we have bond making. So we will start about the bond breaking mechanisms in organic compound in the next session. But what we are saying here is that in order for a species to be involved in the in the, any reaction, not only organic, it must either accept electron or release electron. That means supply electron. So it must either be excess of electron or it must be deficient of electron. Based on this reason, we are classifying the organic reactants into three major categories, as I say. We have nucleophile, nucleophiles, then we have electrophiles, electrophiles, and then we have free radical. Free radical. 
So, nucleophiles, electrophiles, free radicals. Three types of organic reactants. Now, we need to understand each of these and we need to know what is the difference between one organic reactant and another. So, we are starting with the nucleophile, number one. Nucleophile. So, uh, let's start with the nucleophile and let's see how uh, the nucleophile, the proper, their properties and how they involved in the organic reaction. Now, the term nucleo and files, you need to understand this. The term nucleo, nucleo, literally means nucleus. And the term files, its origin is phyl. File, the Greek word which means love. So literally nucleophile means nucleus loving species. Nucleus loving species. Now connect this concept with the concept of principle of charges. Principle, fundamental principle of charges in your form to physics. We say like charges, like charges repel while unlike charges, unlike charges attract. So this principle, the fundamental principle of static electricity is still applied until now. I don't mean now of time, but I mean even for this level, the fundamental principle of static electricity, which is of form 2, is still applied. Now, if you have already understood that nucleophile, the nucleus loving species, and you have already understood like charges they repel, but unlike charges, they attract. Now, I want you to answer my question. If nucleophiles, they love, nu I mean nucleophiles, they are species which love nucleus. That means they have a charge which is opposite to the charge of nucleus. And as we know from our general chemistry, that nucleus it is positively charged because of the presence of protons in the nucleus. We know neutrons, they are neutral and they have no charge. Electrons, they are negatively charged. But protons, they are positively charged. Now, nucleus is positively, positively charged. Nucleus is positively charged. According to the principle, the fundamental principle of static electricity, that means all species which love positively charged species, they must be negatively charged species. So, in a simple language, nucleophiles, they are species which love nucleus. But these species, they must be negatively charged. Now, being negatively charged is not the case because it's just like a principle of static electricity and physics. We are coming back to the principles of chemistry. If any species is negatively charged according to the principles of chemistry, remember your, your, atomic, um, your atomic structure in a form 2 chemistry. When a species is negatively charged, what does it mean? What does it mean when a species is negatively charged? Say we have, uh, let's say we have oxygen to negative. Then you have oxygen. Then you have oxygen to positive. What does it mean? What is the implication of negative? 
Does negative means this species has gained electron or does negative means this species has lost electron? And again remember the electrons themselves, electron itself, it is a negative charge. So by behavior, electron is a negatively charged. Negatively charged. So that means if we have a neutral atom like this, and then we are adding electrons, this neutral atom it must become negatively charged. Why negative charge? Because electrons they are negative charge. So if we are adding them here, if we are adding them, we are making this oxygen to become negatively charged. I want you to understand to understand one concept that nucleophiles they are negative charge. Why they are negative charge? Because they love nucleus, and nucleus is positive charge. So in order for a species to love nucleus which is positive charge, it must be negatively charged. Now that is the principle of static electricity. But if we are coming back to the principles of chemistry, a negatively charged species, it must be rich in electrons. Rich in electrons. So that's where we are starting defining the definition of nucleophile. We are starting to define the definition of nucleophile. So if you have already understood that nucleophiles, they are negatively charged. And if they are negatively charged, it means they are rich in electrons. So they love, they love nucleus because they are negatively charged. And that negative charge, the implication of the negative charge means they are rich in electron. So when we are defining nucleophile, we are saying that they are electron rich species which tend to donate electrons to the electron poor species which is electrophile during chemical reaction to form a covalent bond. So definition of electro, electrophile, I mean nucleophile, by definition nucleophile, we are defining is electron rich species, electron rich species with tendency, with tendency to donate tendency to donate electron pair electron pair to electron pair to electron electron poor electron poor species ambayo anaitwa electrophile electrophile during chemical reaction to form new covalent bond new covalent bond so the important words are which we need them to appear in your definition first it is electron rich species which tend to donate electron because it is electron rich it must donate electron pair to electron poor species which is electrophile to form new covalent bond so very easy electron rich if it is electron rich it will have a tendency to donate electron it will donate electron to where to electron poor species which is in gravity electrophile to form a new covalent bond so this is the simple definition of nucleophile but nucleophiles not all of them they are negative charge i told you that why do they love the nucleus because they have excess of electrons but not all of them they are negative charge don't claim that if we see a negative species the nucleophile it is true any negative charged species 
in organic reaction it is nucleophile but in the case of nucleophile we have several categories of nucleophiles so now let's see the types of nucleophiles types of nucleophiles and we have three of them so we discuss one after another so that it will be easier uh, for you to, to understand uh, what we are what we are discussing so type C of nucleophiles types of nucleophiles type C of nucleophiles types of nucleophiles as I told you that we have three categories our first category it is negatively negatively charged species negative charged species any negative charged species can act like a nucleophile i mean it can act as a nucleophile any negative charged species which you know in the world any negative species negative charged species which you know whether it is chlorine it, i mean it is chloride it is fluoride any so what you are saying is that if substance which have negative charge have excess electrons they have excess electron to donate to the electron deficient species thus acting as nucleophile so they act as a nucleophile because they donate the electrons to the electron poor species examples of nucleophiles which fall under this category here we have some of the few examples but there are many of them for example here uh, we have hydroxyl hydroxyl we have cyanide then here another example it is r o this r is alkyl group then o that means for example here it was H. Maybe this was alcohol R or H. If we remove this hydrogen, that means by by heteroatomic bond cleavage, is how we shall discuss later in the in the next session. So by heteroatomic bond cleavage, if here we have O, then here we have H. Heteroatomic bond cleavage will release all of these electrons to oxygen. So the result the result here will be R, then O. This O will be negatively charged. Then hydrogen will be positively charged. So this negative charge indicates that this is the nucleophile, while this will be electrophile. So uh, this is one among the categories uh, of nucleophile. It is R. Then also we have some other uh, other nucleophiles such as X. X, this one, it is an halogen. For example, if we have hydrogen chloride, then we have, uh, we have done heterolytic bond cleavage. In heterolytic bond cleavage, all the electrons is in the cleave. So the resulting here it will be hydrogen positive charge plus chlorine negative charge. This will act as a nucleophile where hydrogen will act as a Electrophile. So all of these species, they are electron-rich species, and they act as the as the nucleophile. This is the, the first category, the first category of nucleophile. Now we are moving to the second uh, category of nucleophile. The second category of nucleophile, they are substance with at least one lone pair. Substances with at least one lone pair. Substances, substances with at least at least one lone pair. One lone pair. So before going far to discuss these substances. I know some of you students, you don't understand at all the concept of lone pair. I know some of you have not studied general chemistry, and I know some of teachers, they tend to confuse you. So, 
due to such tendencies, it is better for me to teach first the concept of lone pair and then later I will continue with the organic chemistry. So let us first start with the concept of lone pair. What is the lone pair first? Lone pair. Lone pair, we are defining it. In the pair, in the pair of balance electrons which does not does not take part in a normal in a normal covalent covalent bond formation So, every element always forms uh, bonds. But when we are talking of lone pair, we are talking more of the elements which form covalent bond. And most often we are talking of the nanometers. So, a lone pair is the pair of electrons which does not take part in a normal covalent bond formation. So, in order to know lone pair, I give you an easier trick to know lone pair. First, you need to know electronic configuration of the element. Electronic configuration of the element. Electronic configuration. Second, you need to know number of valence electrons which have been involved in the covalent bond formation. Number of valence electrons which take part which take part in a covalent bond covalent bond formation so we can call this number of electron as n And then we can call the total number of electrons, total number of electrons in outermost shell. Let's see, we let, let total number, number of electrons in outermost shell to be T. Now we have T number of electrons in outermost shell. But only N, they have been involved in the normal covalent bond formation. So in order to get the number of electrons which have not involved in the normal covalent bond formation, we are taking is equal to N minus D. And we will we'll get this number. So the number of lone pair, lone pair, Lone pair is equal to n divided by 2. Lone pair is equal to n divided by 2. Why we are dividing by 2? It is because the total number of electrons which does not take part in the normal covalent bond formation is n. So in order to get it pairs, pairs, that means we need two, two. We need them to, to, to be in pairs. We are dividing by by two. Now, let me take an example so as it will be easier for you to understand what I am explaining. It will be easier for you to, to understand what I am explaining here. Now, let me take an example. Uh, let's say in water, in water. So it is H two O. Oxygen, hydrogen. Now, as we know, um, oxygen is number 8. Atomic number of oxygen is 8. Now, I don't want the, the complex electronic configuration of advance. I need only that of four level. So it will be 2, then 6. So the outermost electrons there are 6. 
How many electrons they have been involved in the normal covalent bond formation? So you can see here in this bond, if you see a bond like this, that means there is an electron here and another electron is here. Also, there is an electron here and another electron is here. So in every bond, because this is the covalent bond, one of the electrons is from oxygen and another electron is from hydrogen so for example in this molecule oxygen has only two electrons which have been involved in the normal covalent bond formation so because only two electrons of oxygen they have been involved in the normal covalent bond formation that means four electrons they have not been involved so our A in this case, it is, no, this formula, I wanted to write, I wanted to write it is T minus N, total number of electrons minus number of electrons which have been involved. Our total number of electrons, it is six. But the number of electrons which have been involved in the normal covalent bond formation, they are how many? Only two, this one and this one. So we are writing it to Z, two. We are getting our final mass of N is equal to how many? Four. Now getting the number of electrons from here, we are dividing this four by two. And then we are getting two. So the number of lone pair of oxygen in a water molecule, it is two. So we can draw this is one lone pair and this is one lone pair. And that's why in general chemistry, sometimes you can be asking, you can be asking that why water is bent, why the molecules like carbon dioxide they are not bent. In carbon dioxide, for example. In carbon dioxide, if we can draw the structure of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, it appears as carbon, double bond oxygen, double bond oxygen. So the central atom here in carbon dioxide it is carbon. And for example, the electrons of oxygen which have been involved here in the bond formation layer too. And the electrons of oxygen in this side there are two. But the electrons of carbon, we have one, two, three, four. When we want to discuss the concept of lone pair of an element, for example, what is the number of lone pair of carbon in this molecule? In this molecule, the electron configuration of carbon it is two, then four. An easier way to identify lone pair is just to use the all level electronic configuration. Now, having four outermost electrons, that means T in our case is equal to how many? Four. But also the number of valence electrons which have been used in the formation of normal covalent bond, they are also four. So you end up with zero. You end up with zero. And zero divided by two it is zero. So there is no lone pair. This absence of lone pair does not allow bending in a carbon dioxide as compared with water. The presence of lone pair in water cause repulsion between the, bar, the lone pair electrons and the bond electrons. And according to the valence shell, electron pair repulsion theory. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. The repulsion between these lone pair electrons and the bond 
electrons will cause the bond angle to decrease. And that is the reason, that is the reason we don't draw the structure of water as this way. Why it is because this angle is not 180 again. But the presence of lone pair, presence of lone pair, lone pair, this lone pair they cause repulsion. And this repulsion make the molecule to become bent like this. That was oxygen. How we are getting the number of lone pair in oxygen. Let me have another example. Another example of how we are getting the number of lone pair. Let's calculate for the nitrogen. Let's calculate the number of nitrogen in ammonia. Number of nitrogen in ammonia. Now, let me draw the structure of ammonia. Ammonia is NH3. So, literally, the structure of ammonia will be N. Then H H. However, this is not the search of ammonia. Why? You can understand me later. But this is not the actual structure of ammonia. Whether you can understand me later or with the concept of general chemistry. Now, nitrogen is the element number seven. So it will be 2, 5. So the total number of electrons, our T here is 5. Then we minus. How many electrons they have been used in bone formation? They are 3. So we are getting 2. Divided by 2 is equal to 1. So we have 1 lone pair in nitrogen. But a literal concept which you can use group number five element they have one lone pair group number six two lone pair group number seven three lone pair then noble guesses they have no lone pair group number four lone, no lone pair and the metals from group number one to group number three they have no lone pair that is an easier concept for you to understand about the lone pairs so if you are looking at any element and you know it is a group, it is bad, it is it is easier for you to understand the number of lone pair in that element. But it is not a formula to claim everywhere. So sometimes you need to uh, you need to to calculate first. You need to do your calculations, and those kind of calculations will enable you to know the number of lone pair. So. I will just be explaining about the concept of lone pair, but coming back to the session, we say that any species containing at least one lone pair, it is a nucleophile. Any species containing at least one lone pair, it is a nucleophile. And as we say, a I gave you some examples here of species which contain lone pair. And I said we have water, we have ammonia, and many other species. They can act as nucleophiles. Why? Because they contain lone pair. So the lone pair present maybe in, in nitrogen. It can be donated somewhere. And the same mechanism, negative charge species, they can donate electron. Also, a species with a lone pair can donate electron through the same mechanism. And it can result into the formation of the new bond. So, what we are saying is that if lone pair is the pair of valence electron of an atom which does not take part in the bond formation. So those electrons which would take part in the bond formation can be donated to deficient species during 
the reaction. Hence, the substance acts as a nucleophile. Example of nucleophile under this condition, we have water and ammonia. Now, the reader should understand that in any neutral molecule, in any neutral molecule containing oxygen, there is always two lone pairs. Oxygen is group number six. There is always two lone pairs. And the neutral molecule containing nitrogen, there is always one lone pair because the nitrogen is group number five. So we will have some of the of the organic uh, compounds such as amine, amine. This has a lone pair. Also, organic compounds such as alcohol. This contain two lone pair. So you need to know all of these organic compounds. They can act as it. They can act as it nucleophiles. So some of the some of the uh, compounds such as water and ammonia. They are inorganic, but these are organic and also they can act as a nuclear by to donate, to donate electrons. From there, we are moving to the third group. A third group we are calling them as molecules with pi bond. Molecules with pi bond. Molecules with the now, yesterday I explained much about pi bond, and I said one among the very important features of pi bond is that they are formed by features of pi bond. They are formed by side wave overlap of atomic atomic orbitals but also I said that the pi bonds they are weak weak bonds why? first it is because of the side wave overlap side wave overlap but second, it is because they are formed by unhybridized, unhybridized orbitals. And if you remember, I said these unhybridized orbitals, they have high energy. And as we said that because they have high energy, any species having high amount of energy it is unstable now if we have a pi and a sigma bond in the same in the same carbon let's say it is ch2 double bond ch2 now one of the bond here is sigma and one of the bond is pi and as I said, that we can't form a pi bond in absence of sigma. So, during chemical reaction, if there is an electron deficient species, this bond can be blocked. This bond. And I am very interested in drawing the R. We will discuss it in the next session or the principle of showing the reaction mechanism. But it is very interesting. So, you have already understood they are formed by side wave overlap and you have already understood they are weak. Why they are weak? First, because of the side wave overlap. Second, because they are unhybridized. So, we can't form a pi bond without a sigma bond because it is weak. So, we are forming a sigma bond which is stronger first and then we are forming a pi bond. But I want, I want to show you how these electrons, they are moving to an electrophile. Let's see, let's see how it happens. So, let's see how it happens. Uh, for the molecules such as this, alkene, alkene having a pi bond. So, for the molecules like this, we have CH2, double bond, CH2. Now, in the principles of showing reaction mechanism, if we want to show the movement of the electrons in this molecule, 
We are drawing like this way. Or we can draw like this way. Now, why do we draw like this? Why do we draw like this? This is because this is because when the molecules they are coming from this bone they must pass through either this carbon let's call it this number one or this carbon and the, the carbon where the electrons they are passing it is the one which will be negatively charged and it is the one which will go to bond with an atom which tend to accept the electrons. So these electrons, when they are moving to another molecule, which is an electrophile, they go to, to be, they go to stay, or they, they go somewhere in the orbital of that molecule. Because an electrophile always must have an empty orbital. So, for example, if these electrons, they are passing through this way, that means this bond will break. But by breaking this bond, this one will be negative charge. And we are drawing it this way, while this one will be positive charge. So, why we are drawing this one as negative charge? It is because the, the bond was breaking. But the electrons we are popping through this carbon, we are drawing this as this bond as blocking through this way. But if, for example, if uh, if it is CH two, then double one CH two. If these electrons they could come from here. And pass through this carbon, we could say, oh, this one will be negative charge, and this one will be positive charge. Because if the electrons they are passing through this carbon, this carbon will be rich in electrons, and the another another carbon will be deprived of electrons. So, yeah, these are some of the interesting concepts in organic chemistry, but we'll start discussing them well in the next session. So this is one of the examples of the organic compound and it contains a pi-bond. Pi-bond can donate electron and can act as the can act as the, the nuclear pi. But also uh, we have some in the organic compounds such as carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide, it is a nucleophile because it contains pi bond. So we need this bond breaking this bond and for the for the case of, of elements like carbon dioxide here there is difference in electronegativity it is different as compared with the uh, atoms like CH2 I mean molecules like CH2, CH2 because the electronegativity of this element and this one they are equal but in case of carbon dioxide the electronegativity they are different so due to difference in electronegativity uh, we know that the electrons always will be put to the atom with the low electronegativity. So breaking the bond here will make breaking the bond will make oxygen negative charge and carbon positive charge. So the reaction will be in such a way oxygen will be, will be attached to another group as how we shall discuss in the next session. But the important thing for you to know here is that if all compounds containing pi bond, they are also nuclear. So what we are saying is that pi bond is weak because it is formed by sideway overlapping of atomic orbitals, which has small region of overlapping of atomic orbitals. Also, pi bond cannot exist in its own without presence of sigma bond, which is stronger. So pi bond present in double and triple bond, and it is it is weaker. So, what you are saying about pi bond if it is weaker now? So pi pi electrons can be donated to 
deficient species and the molecule become nucleophile. Example of nucleophile under this category are alkene and alkyne, also some of the inorganic compounds such as the carbon dioxide. So now we have already discussed about the categories of uh, nucleophiles and let's continue with another part, another part of nucleophile and now let's discuss about the factors affecting the nucleophilicity, factors affecting the nucleophilicity of a molecule, factors affecting the nucleophilicity, factors affecting nucleophilicity, nucleophilicity. In this language, when we are talking about nucleophilicity, sometimes we call it the nucleophilic power. Nucleophilic power. Remember from our definition of nucleophile, they are electron rich species which donate electrons to electron poor species during chemical reaction to form a new bond. Now, nucleophilicity of a nucleophile will be determined by the ability of a nucleophile to donate electron. If a nucleophile has a high ability to donate electron to an electrophile, it will be counted as it is highly nucleophilic or it has a high nucleophilic power. Again, the reverse is true. If a nucleophile has a lower ability to donate electrons to another species which is electrophile, it will have low nucleophilicity or low nucleophilic power. So, a best example of nucleophilicity ni kama vile mtu akiwa na kitu halafu mwenzake hana. Mtu akiwa na kitu mwenzake hana. So, yule mtu ambaye ni mchoyo, yani ni mchoyo, hawezi ya kampa mwenzake. So, tunasema ule pale ana, ana low nucleophilicity. Kwa sabi ye ni mchoyo, hawezi ya kampa mwenzake. In atoms, uchoyo, we can define as electronegativity. If this nucleophile itself has a higher electronegativity, it is a nucleophile. It has a lone pair. It is a negative charge. But it is a, it loves the electrons. So it tends to remain with its own electrons. And due to the tendency of remaining with its own electrons, we are saying that this has low nucleophilicity or low nucleophilic power. But we will have other species which have electrons and themselves they have low electronegativity. That means they do not attract much electrons. So it is easier for them to release. These species will term them as they have high nucleophilicity. Ni kwamba wao sio wachoyo, wakiona tu electrophile hana electron, wanampa electron. So this is the best example of explaining about the nucleophilic power the ability of a nucleophile to donate electron. Those having the high nucleophilic power or those having the high nucleophilicity, they will easily donate electron as compared with those having the low nucleophilic power. Now, let's go on. We have about four factors. However, the explanation will be like interacting each other, but they are four distinct factors. Nucleophilicity or nucleophilic strength, or sometimes it is called as nucleophilic power. Nucleophilic strength, nucleophilic power, nucleophilicity it is the same thing. Of a substance, if the relative reactivity of a nucleophile reagent, it refers to a substance's nucleophilic character, or in easier way, it refers to a substance, substances, 
ability to donate electron to an electron poor species. So nucleophilicity refers to the ability of a substance to donate electron to the electrophile. So we have about four factors. First is the negative charge intensity. Negative charge intensity. Then we have electronegativity. We have atomic size and the nature of the solvent of reaction medium. So let's start with the, our, our first factor, which is negative charge extent. Negative charge extent. As I said, that the first category of nucleophile, they are negative charged species. So if they are negative charged species, that means the negative charge indicated that the, the species has gained electrons. So for example, if we have oxygen to negative, then we have oxygen negative, then we have oxygen. So here I have three species. If we consider the strength of negative charge, this oxygen will be more negative charge, more negatively, negatively charged as compared with other species. Now what does this more negative charge implicate? What is the implication of more negative charge? What does this mean? What is the importance of being more negative charge? This oxygen, being more negative charge, it will be easier, easier for it to donate electrons. Why it will be easier? Because it is rich in electron. It is rich in electron. However, in normal situation, if we are considering to people, some of people they have money, but they are, they are still a choice. Son. But for the case of atoms, now because atoms they are not living, so atoms it is not like a human being. Some of the human beings they, they have such kind of, uh, of behaviors, it is because of the, uh, some of their consciousness. They know that they had a conflict with someone, someone did bad for me. But in the case of atoms, atoms they don't have conflicts. An atom having many electrons, it will be easier for it to donate electrons, and by donating the electrons, it will be more nucleophilic. So, an atom which is more negative charge will also be more nucleophilic. Nucleophilic. Or will have a high nucleophilicity or nucleophilic power. So, based on this factor, if we are starting to this oxygen going this way, we will say that decreasing nucleophilicity. Decreasing nucleophilicity. Why it is decreasing? Because as the strength of negative charge decreases, it becomes very difficult for such kind of species to donate the electrons. So let me have some of the information here, some of the explanation. But I have already explained here about this. It has been experimentally shown that it a nucleophile, a nucleophile containing negative charge B, reactive atom is better than a nucleophile containing reactive atom that is neutral. So this will be better than this one. Experimentally proved. It. Now, nucleophilicity increases as the charge on the atom become more negative. Nucleophilicity 
increases as the charge on an atom become more negative. So for this information, it is easier for you to understand what I was just telling you. For example, here they have given us uh, three, three nuclear points uh, in, the, in the example here. They have given us three nuclear points. But the explanation of uh, what they have explained here, it is the same as how I explained it. So our first nuclear point was it is the H O then negative. Then here we have another nuclear file, which is H2O, and then we have H3 O positive. So if we have these three molecules, the strength of nuclear crystal of this one is greater than this one, and this one is greater than this one. So when we are going this way, we are decreasing. Decreasing nucleophilicity. Why? It is because this one is rich in electron. This one is neutral. But this one is the previous electron. Being the previous electron, manake, we mwenye umeishiwa yela. Ko ata kutoa kumpa mwenza kwa takwa kazi. Kusabu we mwenye we maskini na we. This is how we apply it in the, in the concept of nuclear physics. So, for example, if we have, uh, we have two reactions now. If we have two reactions, the reactions of, of reaction, they are the same, but the difference is the nuclear file which it is used in that reaction. For example, we have uh, CH3, Chlorine, then plus HO negative to form CH3 hydroxy plus chlorine ion and, and CH3 chlorine plus H2O to form CH3 OH2 plus now, I think if you have understood me, it will be very easy for you to say which reaction will be fast here and which one will be slow. Basing on the concept of nucleophile, which tend to donate the electrons, it's not much good for me to show the reaction mechanism here because you don't understand the principles of showing reaction mechanism. We'll discuss them later in the next session. But basing on the Nucleophilicity. This one will be more nucleophilic than this one. So due to that reason, this reaction, our first reaction here, will be fast. And this one will be slow. Why slow? Because of the nucleophilicity of this nucleophile which have been used in here. So in the lab, when we are doing experiments, in order to make sure that the reaction is fast, we need to make the nucleophile more negative in case of negative charge so as uh, it can be easier for it to react with an electrophile. Now we are moving to the second factor which is electronegativity. Our second factor is electronegativity. 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 Electronegativity is ability of an atom to attract electrons towards itself. Ability of an atom to attract electrons. Yani electronegativity kiufupi ni kama uchoyo electron. Sasa, nucleophile, we need it to react by donating electrons. We need a nucleophile to react by donating electrons. Why electronegativity is selfishness of electrons. So why the nucleophile should be supply electrons in order to react? If a nucleophile has higher electronegativity, means it will be more selfish in electron. 
It wants to stay with its own electrons. That means electronegativity, it is inversely proportional to nucleophilicity. Why? It is because we want a nucleophile to donate electron. While as electronegativity increases, the ability of a nucleophile to donate electron tends to decrease. Why it decreases? Because it tends to stay with its own electron and it doesn't want to give anyone. I love because I remember the, when you were in primary school, you found someone is buying maybe a lot of bagheas and then when others they come and say, Naomba, Naomba, give me, give me, Naomba, Naomba. Then he, he give only one piece and then he say, Chaote. That means this, uh, this bagia, it is one but you need to eat all. But myself, I can eat even ten because I have money. All my parents, they have money. So I need, to, I, I need to have many. I need to eat many. But for you, you don't have money. So there is no need for you to, to eat many. So I love uh, I've just remembered some of the of the life of the school. You know, you have studied some of the school. Tunavita Shule Zabidumbi and Jano. You are taking your your galon and then you are going with it at school. Then if you are reaching at school, they ask you, where is water? Where is water for watering the flowers? If you don't have water, they, they give you, they, they they punish you. Or some of the brothers, if you are passing under the road, they they take that that galon and then. <laughs> And then when they take that galon, it is, it is very difficult for you to, to, go in, uh, to go to school again because you, you are thinking that, how can I talk to my teachers today because they want me to have a galon. So it is very interesting to remember some of the life of the primary school. So it, it was just like a, a time of entertainment. But we were talking the concept of electronegativity. So a kid, a kid taking a lot of bagheas, and say, Niza kwangu, Niza kwangu. Then he gives you one saying it is chaote. That means he has higher electronegativity, but not electronegativity. He has higher, or she has higher electrobagiativity. So she loves more, she loves more, she loves more bagheas. She loves more bagheas. So she's attracted more with bagheas. And she doesn't want to donate bagheas to others. So the same concept can be used in electro. But if uh, someone has those bagheas and then he, she or he is fair, he provides them to others and then they eat, they enjoy. So the nucleophiles having higher electronegativity will be less reactive. Or nucleophiles having higher electronegativity will be less nucleophilic. Will be less nucleophilic. So this is applied more special for the elements maybe in the period or in the group. Either in the period or in the group. As we know in the trends of periodic table uh, trends of periodic table the trends of electronegativity table as we are moving in the period uh, from left to right in the periodic table, from left to right, electronegativity, electronegativity tend to increase. While as we are moving from up to down, electronegativity, electronegativity. tend to decrease. So, the concept of electronegativity and the nucleophilic character can help you to differentiate between the nucleophilic character of two compounds present in the same in the same group and different periods. Or two compounds present in the Maybe, for example, let me give you an example. We have water, and then we have uh, we have these two compounds. 
but water oxygen is oxygen is group number six in group number six in the period two we have oxygen in the period three we have sulfur this is just the the piece of periodic table to show what I'm explaining. Now, as I say, from up to down, electronegativity tend to, to decrease. There are two lone pairs sulfur and two lone pairs oxygen. If we are using these two nucleophiles in the chemical reaction, what do you think about the properties of these two nucleophiles? Oxygen contains two lone pairs like sulfur. But what about the uh, electronegative? I mean, what about the uh, nucleophilicity? Probably, if you understood me, you will comment this: that oxygen, oxygen has more atomic size. Due to this small atomic size, it will have higher. Electronegativity. While the sulfur have larger atomic size. And due to this, it will have smaller electronegativity. So, sulfur will have small electronegativity as compared with oxygen. The best nucleophile among these two it is sulfur. Dihydrogen sulfide. So, dihydrogen sulfide can react faster than water. Why? It is because of the size of sulfur. So, what we are saying. Uh, we can also different. For example, I have given you the examples in the in the same book. But we may have uh, examples in the same period. In the same period, for example, um, here in this period two. In this period two, we have nitrogen is group number five. We have oxygen. Then you have oxygen, after oxygen, I mean here we have carbon, we have nitrogen, we have oxygen, after oxygen which is group number 5, group number, oxygen is group number 6, group number 7 we have fluoride, group number 7, group number 5, group number 4. Now, now if we want to compare our nucleophiles containing these elements, Let's say uh, we have a nuclear file like, he, like what we are given as an example in Ingaiza here. We have a nuclear file like he, H3, C, then negative. Then we have H2, N negative. Then we have H, O negative. And then we have. So all of these nucleophiles, they have the same extent of negative charge. Negative charge here is one, here is one, here is one, here is one. But what differ to them is the electronegativity. As we say, as we are moving from left to right in the periodic table, electronegativity tend to increase. So among these electronegativity, this one, this one, will be easier for it to react as compared with this one. It will be very easier for it to, to react. So when we are talking of electronegativity of the elements, this one will be more electronegative, but it will be less nucleophilic. It will be less nucleophilic. So it can't, it can't react faster as how this one tends to react.
That is intensity of electronegativity. However, the concept of electronegativity and atomic size, they are going together, or atomic radius. Because electronegativity is affected by atomic radius. So when we'll be going to discuss about the concept of atomic radius, I hope it will be very easy for you to understand because these concepts they are going together. So our 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 third factor is the atomic size or atomic radius. Atomic size or atomic radius. But as I told you, that atomic atomic radius and the electronegativity. They are just similar concepts. They are just similar concepts. So, uh, don't you all about uh, understanding the concept of um, atomic radius. So, in terms of atomic size, atomic size, we are saying that uh, the size of reactive atom in the nucleophile, and hence the size of, uh, and hence size of uh, nucleophile, is dominant for explaining the variation of nucleophilicity in a neutral or in charged D. So atomic, uh, atomic size, we can use it to explain the nucleophilicity of neutral, neutral atoms. Neutral atoms or neutral molecules such as an example which I gave you of water and hydrogen sulfide. Uh, oxygen being, being group, uh, I mean being period two, it is more electronegative and will have small atomic size as compared with the, with the sulfur. So by that means, sulfur will be, hydrogen sulfide will be more reactive. The hydrogen sulfide will be more reactive as compared with the water. Now, let's move to the fourth factor. The fourth factor, which is nature of solvent. Nature of solvent. So because I'm using Gaiza, I know some other explanation you will go to read them in Gaiza. But it is very easy for you to understand and, and to know what we are talking about. Now we are going to nature of solvent. Nature of solvent which is used in the chemical reaction, it can affect the nucleophilicity of a nucleophile. Now, based on this, we have two major categories of solvent. Two major categories of solvent. We have polar and non-polar. Polar solvent, as we know, polar dissolve polar. So polar solvent will dissolve polar reactive molecule. But one among the major things to understand here is about these which are called as polar. This polar, we have two categories again. So what we are saying is that solvent can be classified as being either polar or non-polar. Polar solvent can be further classified as protic or aprotic. As protic or aprotic. Now, what is the difference between a protic and a protic? And what is the implication, how the implication behind being protic or a protic? Protic solvent, if the solvent is having a hydrogen atom, bonded to oxygen or nitrogen. In other words, protic solvent is the solvent having a hydrogen atom bonded to more electronegative atom. By that means, if we remember the concept of polar bonds, we say if hydrogen it is bonded to more electronegative atoms, say oxygen. Then here, there is another group, let's say R. For example, this will be an alcohol. Or sometimes we have uh, hydrogen 
bonded to nitrogen, then R. So, what we are saying here is that here we may have another. What we are saying here is that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So, oxygen will attract electron and will form a partial negative. By oxygen, hydrogen will form a partial positive. And here, we will form a polar bond containing a dipole moment, pulling electrons towards the more electronegative atom, which is oxygen. So now, when we are talking of the of the protein solvent, what do we mean? This hydrogen be partially positive. And if we remember we say nucleophiles, they are negative charge. So there will be an attraction between a nucleophile and this hydrogen. And they will form what we call as the hydrogen bond. This hydrogen bond, as we know from general chemistry, hydrogen bond in nature, it is stronger, stronger, intermolecular, intermolecular force as compared to other forces. So the presence of this stronger intermolecular force will tend to decrease the charge on the nucleophile because this nucleophile will be surrounded by the molecules of the solvent and that will decrease the positive charge strength on the nucleophile. By decreasing the positive charge strength on the nucleophile, that will lead to decreasing nucleophilicity. So what I mean it is decreasing the negative charge strength, not the positive charge strength. It decreases the negative charge strength on the nucleophile. And by decreasing the negative charge strength, it decreases the nucleophilicity. So, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> what you are saying is that Protic solvent have positively polarized hydrogen atom. The positively polarized hydrogen atom due to attraction of the electrons by the more electronegative atom. Most often it is oxygen or hydrogen. The third phenomena can occur with it. Can occur with it and amine. The same phenomenon. So protic solvent are positively uh, positively polarized hydrogen atom. Example of protic solvent including we can have water. Uh, water, then ROH, RNH2, all of these they are examples of the protic of the protic solvent. So water is in organic. Why is this one and this one? This is alcohol, this is the amine. So water is in organic, amine and alcohol they are organic. So, a protic solvent is a solvent that lacks positively polarized hydrogen. In terms of a protic, they lack positive polarized hydrogen. For example, we have CH3, then CO, CH3. This is called acetone. Acetone. Acetone, and then we have. You have this one. So these are just examples of a protic solvent. But we want to explain uh, the implication of being a protic or protic. I have explained here and I hope uh, if you listen well, you have already understood. But let me just uh, repeat a little for your better understanding and for your better performance in your, in your exams. So I say, this positive charge hydrogen 
we tend to form a dotted bond with the nuclear file. And not only this one, but this nuclear file will tend to be surrounded by these molecules of protein solvent. We tend to be surrounded by the molecules of, of protein solvent. So let's say uh, if we have nucleophile, we have we have hydrogen, which is positive charge, then oxygen, which is negative charge, partial negative, then R. Also on this side we have hydrogen, partial negative, positive charge, we have oxygen, partial negative charge, then we have R. Also on this side we have uh, I mean this one is a dotted bond, so it's better if I could draw it in dotted line for your understanding. So in this side also we have hydrogen, partial positive charge, then oxygen, partial negative charge, then R. And in this side also we have hydrogen, partial positive charge, oxygen, partial negative charge, then R. So this is what happens. One nucleophile has been surrounded by the molecules of the solvent. And this is because of the formation of these bonds, which we are calling them as a hydrogen bond. So these bonds and the presence of molecules of protic solvent around the nucleophile tend to decrease its negative charge strength and due to that reason the nucleophilicity of this molecule tend to decrease. So this is what protic solvent they are doing. So when your protic solvent are used as medium in a nucleophilic reaction the positively polarized hydrogen of the solvent molecule can interact with the negatively charged nucleophile through hydrogen bonding. In a solution, molecules or ions that are surrounded by solvent molecule are said to be solvated. Solvated. Now, by definition, solvation. Solvation. We are writing it as solvation. By definition, solvation is the process of attraction and the association of solvent molecules with the ions of a solid. So this is the solid. Then there is attraction and the association of solvent molecules with ions of a solid. That's what you call as solvation. So, in this case, we have solvation between nucleophile and, the, and alcohol. But what, what, what do we mean? What is the implication of this? So, what is the effect of this solvation? Solvation weakens the nucleophile, making it less nucleophilic. That is, solvation decreases, solvation decreases nucleophilicity. This is because the solvent forms a shell around the nucleophile, decreasing the nucleophile's ability to attack the electrophile, or the nucleophile's ability to donate electrons to the electrophile. So, what you are saying, is that furthermore, because the charge on the small ions, small ions is more concentrated, small anions are more tightly solvated than large anions, and hence they become less nucleophilic, and their lone pair become less accessible to electrophile as the result of solvation. So, for example, we give an example here um, of hydrogen, three carbon. Then you add uh, hydrogen to nitrogen, 
then you have hydrogen, oxygen, then you have chlorine. Among this, this one will have high solution, and this one will have low solution. This is because charge on the on that small atom it will be very easy for it to attract it, to attract the solvent and to associate with it. Now when the upside if we have a protic solvent, a protic solvent they do not have the polarized hydrogen. Due to absence of polarized hydrogen, that means they can't form hydrogen bond. So they just form a weak dipole in terms of a protic. So a protic solvent, like a protic solvent, are polar. But because they lack possibly polarized hydrogen, they do not form hydrogen bonding with an ionic nucleophile. They do not form hydrogen bond. This is a weak solvation and the result of relatively weak interaction between the aprotic solvent and the nucleophile. So aprotic solvent, they have low solvation. Now, due to low solvation, will have some of the fuel advantage. The first one that will increase the rate of chemical reaction. By using an aprotic solvent at the reaction medium, the reactivity of the nucleophile is increased. But sometimes, a second case is that the reactivity tends to change. Uh, the example which has been used by guys here, it is fluorine, then iod, uh, fluorine, then chlorine, then bromine, then iodine. So among these, uh, this one has smaller atomic size, and this one has higher atomic size. If we are using a protic solvent, this one will, will be more solvated. This one will be less solvated. The final result by using protic solvent, the nucleophilicity will increase by size. So nucleophilicity increases with decrease in the solvation. That is the final result of using protic solvent. But in the case of a protic solvent, sometimes the case tends to reverse. So not only the association will be small, but also in case of protic solvent, sometimes I mean a protic solvent, a protic solvent, sometimes this one become more reactive than other elements. Sometimes not always. So that marks the end of our discussion about the nucleophiles. If you have understood much about the nucleophiles, uh, we are just running very quickly with the with the electrophiles and the free radicals because uh, nucleophiles they have a longer discussion as compared with the electrophiles and the free radicals. So you are better understanding of nucleophiles, we are able to uh, answer many questions and you are able to be very competent in other parts of the organic chemistry. Now let's uh, bring a finish up with the electrophiles and the free radicals. Let's start with the electrophiles. Electrophiles. So this is very easy. Electron means electron. And electron is negatively charged. Negatively charged. And the phi means the lab. Phi is the lab from the only phi. Phi that means love. So these are 
a little loving species. Why do they love a little according to the principle of fundamental charges? Because they are poor in electrons or oh, in good language in the chemistry we are using they are deprived so if you are saying they are deprived of electron it is best than poor so they are deprived of electron or oh, they are deficient deficient or deprived and thus they react they react by accepting accepting electrons from electron rich species so nucleophiles they are uh, electrophiles they are reacting by receiving the electrons so one thing you need to know about the electrophiles they are reacting by receiving the electrons one thing you need to know about the electrophiles is that any molecule which tend to react by receiving electrons, any molecule which tend to react by receiving electrons, it must have an empty orbital. Empty orbital, very important. An empty orbital like this. So when a nucleophile tends to donate electron pair, this electron pair comes to stay in that empty orbital. We have two categories of electrophiles. First is the substance with positive charge. Substances with positive charge. Positive charge. But second is the Lewis acids. So substances with positive charge, we know positive charge means a substance has donated electron. So, due to donation of electrons and becoming positive charge means it is deprived of electrons. But in the case of Lewis acid, Lewis acid, they are uncharged, but they contain an empty orbital. For example, aluminium chloride and boron fluoride. So, uh, no, this is not, yeah, it is three. So, if you have studied acid base and salt, I know you, have the, you know the concept of Lewis acid. But if you don't know, uh, we are saying that in acid base and salt, we had three theories suggesting about the concept of acid and bases. So, we have um, Arrhenius, we have Lons and Jensen, and then we have, we have the Lewis. According to Arrhenius, he used the, uh, to categorize them according to the nation of proton or Hydroxy. However, Lenz and Jensen modified it according to donation of proton or receiving. But Lewis he classified the acid and bases in terms of donation and reception of electrons. So according to Lewis, any species which tend to receive the electron pair during chemical reaction, he called it as a Lewis acid. So, for example, aluminium, let us use aluminium, for example, electronic configuration, okay. the electronic configuration for aluminium is 1s2, then 2s2, it is 2p3, then 3s2. Yeah, it's 2, 4, it is 2p6, then 3p. One. This is the electronic configuration of, of aluminium. So, for aluminium to form, to form aluminium chloride like this, that means these are the empty orbitals. We have two S, and then we have P. So, for aluminium to form a compound like this, that means. Here we have S 
and then we have P, P having, having one electron. So that means one of the electron uh, should be subtracted to this orbital and they must hybridize to form. So we'll have chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. But this orbital will be empty. So this empty orbital is the one which is used to receive electron pair during organic reactions. That's why it's termed as let me see, S. So in terms of our nucleophilic electrophilic character, the electrophilic character will depend on the strength of positive charge. However, electrophile because they are receiving electron, because they are receiving electron, we don't discuss much with them. Yani ni kama bide, mungina anatoa ela, mungina anapokea. Anayapokea ela, atuwezi kwa mdiskasa sana kwa sabu. Kupokea ela wengi wanapenda ela kwa huu. Lakini soa ala kutoa wangine kuna uchoyo, kuna nini. So we, we must be discussed more than those which are receiving. But you can move to free radicals. Free radicals. Now, free radicals, they contain a single electron. Or in other words, they are neutral. For example, if we have chlorine gas, that means this one is chlorine, bond chlorine. So, by homolytic bond cleavage, if one electron is taken by chlorine and one electron is taken by chlorine, the resulting molecules will call them as chlorine plus chlorine. We know chlorine cannot exist like this one because it is unstable. So to gain stability, it, it appears in this form. It appears as diatomic. But if we are using, maybe UV light here. By using this UV light, we can break this chlorine in the presence of UV light. So we can do what we call is homolytic homolytic bond cleavage to get this. Now these are what we call as free radicals. In organic chemistry, free radicals we are writing them with this dot. Any free radical we are writing an element with this free, uh, with this dot. So for example sometimes you can write as CH3 then dot. That means this is free radical. Or we can write a hydrogen, then dot. Or fluorine, then dot. That is free radical. Free radical is somehow different from the electrophiles and the nucleophiles. Because in the electrophile, in the electrophile, electrophile, they are positive charge. And the nucleophiles, they are negatively charged. This positive charge means the presence of empty orbital like this. And this negative charge means the presence of excess pair of electrons. So, because here there is empty orbital, this negative charge, which is a pair of electrons, will come and it will occupy this space. To form, to form a full orbital with the two electrons. Now, a reaction between electrophile and nucleophile can result into electrophile has formed a bond with the nucleophile. This bond is what we are drawing at the, at the orbital with the paired electrons. But in the case of free radicals, they contain only one electron. Free radicals contain only one electron. So due to that, free radicals cannot react with electrophile or nucleophile. A free radical can react only with the 
another free radical. For example, chlorine plus chlorine. We are getting chlorine gas. Or in other words, it is chlorine bond chlorine. But you can't get chlorine with electrophile, which is possible. Why? Because this is an empty orbit. So, because this is one electron and this is one electron, here we will form an orbit with the two electrons. But this one is an electron, while here is an empty orbit. So, we will form an orbit containing one electron, which is impossible. A bonded orbital must have two electrons. But if we are getting a free radical with a nucleophile, nucleophile already contains two electrons. So adding this electron, we will end up with a bond having three electrons. Something which is impossible and never exists. So by that way, we are saying that a free radical cannot react with the electrophile. The reason behind is that free radical is one electron, while electrophile has no electron. So, a resulting orbital will have one electron. A free radical cannot react with the nucleophile because the nucleophile is a pair of electrons, while a free radical has one electron. So, the resulting orbital will have three electrons. But a free radical can react with only a free radical. Again, these free radicals they are formed by homolytic bond cleavage. While electrophile and nucleophile they are formed by heterolytic bond cleavage. What do we mean? If we have a compound like this, chlorine, chlorine. If we are doing homolytic bond cleavage, we are drawing a half an hour. This is a full hour, this is a half. This is the movement of one electron. Electron, while this is the movement of two electrons. So if one electron goes this way and one electron, we are getting two free radicals. But if we are doing a heterolytic bond cleavage, that is chlorine, bond chlorine, then all electrons are going to that chlorine. We will get an electrophile and a neutrophil. So, heterolytic bond cleavage, in which all electrons they are taken by one atom, and more often heterolytic bond cleavage is done in atoms which differ in electronegativity. For example, this one could be hydrogen. But I've written this up for the case of example only. I've written this up already for the case of example. So that is a free radical. That is a free radical. It can't react with the electrophile or nucleophile. It is formed by homoic bond cleavage. It has one electron. This marks the end of our session. In the next session, we'll be discussing what the principles of showing the reaction mechanism. Reaction mechanism. Principles of showing reaction mechanism. We start with bond cleavage, then we start with the reaction mechanism. Thank you, everybody, and later wish you nice studies.